Have you heard of the Passion of the Christ, especially around Easter time? The way that we use the term passion in everyday life, you might think that this term refers to the deep, dutiful love that Jesus felt for humanity. From his radical teachings and reputation as the bad boy rabbi of the ancient Near East, it's pretty easy to assume that Jesus was a rather passionate guy. But this is not exactly what the term means in this context. In fact, the modern English word passion comes from a Latin root word meaning to suffer, meaning that the passion of the Christ might better translate to the suffering of Christ. Before his miraculous resurrection on Easter Sunday, Jesus was arrested, tried, tortured, and executed on the cross. Not exactly the joyous Easter story we like sharing over a ham dinner. But it's important to recognize the great pain that Jesus endured because of the sins of the world. After all, his sacrifice is the very foundation of Christian teaching. And it's only through remembering pain, turmoil, and suffering that we can learn to appreciate resurrection for its triumph over death. So what's up with the passion of the Christ? The week before Easter Sunday is called Holy Week and recognizes the events leading up to Jesus' resurrection. On Palm Sunday, we remember his triumphant entrance into Jerusalem. On Maundy Thursday, we take communion in honor of the Last Supper. And on Good Friday, we mourn his death. Each of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, describe the events of Jesus' trial, torture, and execution with slight variation. But the broad strokes and main plot beats go like this. After the Last Supper, when Jesus revealed that someone was going to betray him, he and a few disciples spent the night praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. In the morning, Judas brought some soldiers and high-ranking priests to arrest him. After a brief scuffle where Peter cut someone's ear off, Jesus was eventually taken into custody. He was then tried and found guilty of blasphemy, or teaching offensive things that went against the priest's beliefs about God. For instance, allegedly claiming that he was the son of God. Because Judea, the region in which the temple was in Jerusalem, was under Roman occupation, the priests didn't have the authority to sentence him to death themselves. So they took him before their Roman governor, named Pontius Pilate. They claimed that Jesus was an insurrectionist, calling himself the king of the Jews and was a threat to the imperial power. Pilate didn't initially find enough evidence to convict Jesus himself, but at the insistence of the priests and the gathered crowd, decided to sentence Jesus to death anyway. An important note here, for hundreds if not thousands of years, these passages have been used as an excuse for promoting violent anti-Semitism. But to be clear, at no point does the Bible inherently suggest that Judaism is to blame for the torture or death of Jesus. At times, the Gospel writers name the Jews as those opposed to Jesus, but we understand that to mean the particular Jewish leaders of the day in that place. And we know that these Jewish leaders were not all of one mind. We can read these scriptures and still respect the living cultures represented within their pages. We can think critically and carefully examine the biases of both modern and ancient storytellers. And we can acknowledge that the gospel writers spread the blame around. There were many people who could have intervened and did not. The crowd is even to blame. All of humanity is indicted in this story. We have all been perpetrators of and bystanders to injustice. Pontius Pilate had a tradition of releasing one prisoner in honor of the Passover holiday. On this particular year, he gave the crowds a choice between freeing Jesus the Messiah and another man named Jesus Barabbas, who had been previously arrested for insurrection. Ultimately, Barabbas was freed and Pilate sentenced Jesus the Messiah to be crucified, a Roman method of execution by hanging the victim on a cross. But first, Jesus was whipped and publicly mocked. He was dressed in fine clothes, given a crown of thorns and a scepter made from a thin reed. Bloodied, beaten, and spat on, he was ridiculed as the image of the king they said he claimed to be. After his humiliation, Jesus was forced to carry his own cross up a hill to a place either called Golgotha or Calvary, where he was then stripped naked and nailed to the cross by spikes driven through his wrists. He was offered wine mixed with myrrh as an anesthetic, but he refused to drink it. Jesus hung beside two other victims for an entire day, until he ultimately died from a combination of dehydration, blood loss, exhaustion, and ultimately asphyxiation. According to Luke, his last words were, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. According to Mark, they were, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then the Romans confirmed he was dead by piercing him through the side with a spear, and his body was taken by a man named Joseph to be sealed in a tomb. And there he remained, for three days until he rose again just as he had promised many times to his disciples. But the rest is a story for another week. The Passion narrative is very painful to read. 
but it is an important and foundational text to the Christian faith, and many of the gory specifics are actually allusions to well-known prophecies about the promised Messiah. They also have deep symbolism that is foundational to many Christian practices. For instance, John reminds us several times in his writing that scriptures were being fulfilled during several moments during the procedure. The pain of Holy Week is vital to our appreciation of Easter's joy. Our acts of evil, injustice, and oppression separate us from God. But God loves us so much that Jesus died on the cross of evil, injustice, and oppression so that we might all be free. These stories show the suffering of life as well as a profound and enduring love.